When I was involved in broadcasting, I used to have the first hour of my show as a disc jockey in Columbus, Ohio. I used to give an inspirational program. And there was a lady that used to call me by the name of Audrey Pelmore. Audrey worked at University Hospital. Audrey was an enthusiastic personality that everybody liked her. I mean, she had a radiant smile and she was just one of those people. You ever meet one of those people that everybody just liked them? She was one of those kind of folks. Audrey became stricken with muscular sclerosis at a very young age. And after a while, she became confined to a wheelchair. She had children. And because of her, her physical deterioration, she could no longer take care of her children. And she had to be confined to a nursing home, Alum Creek Nursing Home on Nelson Avenue in Columbus, Ohio. Audrey used to have the nurses at the hospital call the radio station and put the phone to her ear. And she would ask for a certain request. And I would ask her to say a few words to the listening audience. One day while I was doing my program, I got a call from one of my regular callers, a young lady by the name of Shirley. Shirley, on this particular day, there was a sound in her voice and I detected that something was wrong. And she said to me, it's nice talking to you, Les. I'll be seeing you. And I said, wait, wait, hold a minute, Shirley. There's something wrong. She says, there's nothing wrong. I said, there is, Shirley. I know you. Come on, Shirley, what's wrong? Where Shirley had been diagnosed as having cancer of the breast. And they told her that she had a 60-40 chance of not surviving. During the time that she had had her medical examination, her husband had become distant. Through the pressure of losing her husband and the illness, she just felt, hey, I'm not the kind of person that can handle suffering and I'd rather just end it quickly. She was at a critical point in her life, and this is the option that she decided to take. I did everything I could to discourage her, to give her a reason to want to go on living. I was trying to find something that she can hold on to that would give her a sense of hope, some thread, I, and I used scripture and everything. And one of my fallback positions, Lord grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And she didn't budge, that did not work. And I was out of my arsenal of what can I do to hold on to her, to get her to change her mind, to create a shift in her thinking. And the thought came to me, I said, Shirley, could you wait until tomorrow? She waited for a long time before she answered. She said, why tomorrow? I said, because if you wait until tomorrow, I'd like to take you by to see Audrey Pelmore. You remember Audrey that I talk about all the time on the air? She said, yes, I like her. I would like to meet her. And she met me at the Allen Creek Nursing Home. And when we got there, we were both very silent because I'd made a pact with her that if this was not enough to discourage her from taking her life, then I would honor our agreement and I would just release her. And I was going to talk to somebody else to try and get her. I didn't tell her that. As we walked down the hall, I did not know exactly what to expect. I had not seen Audrey for some time. When we walked in the room, there Audrey was, all twisted and physically deformed. She had no voluntary use of her arms. She couldn't even fan a fly out of her face. She couldn't get up and move around. And we had to get close to her because her vision was blurred and she can't speak very loudly. And her hearing was somewhat impaired. And as we drew closer to her, I said, Audrey, this is Les. And I have a friend with me named Shirley. How you doing, Audrey? And with what strength she had, she said, better than good and better than much. And surely, I know as the tears begin to form in our eyes, I know she had to be thinking that here this woman is. She's been on her back, a prisoner in her body for 17 years. She can't turn herself. She can't get up and go to the restroom. She said to me, Les, I'd love to be able to get up and walk out of here with you. I'd love to be able to take care of my children, to be a mother to them, to see them graduate from high school. She said, Les, I can't do that. And I'm doing better than good and better than most. Shirley had to be saying within herself, what right do I have to feel sorry for myself? What right do I have to cry out, why me? And she decided and left there with a commitment that she wanted to live with whatever time that she had left, that she had no right to cut the time off. She had no right to do that. 
And she left there with a new determination, a new spirit about her. And that's something about what we have, that you have. There sometimes your options are frozen. See, Audrey can't walk out of a hospital. She did not have the capacity to take care of her children, but she had a freedom of spirit. And that's what we have, wherever we are, with whatever hand that life has dealt us. We have the freedom of spirit. We can go through life whining and weeping, or we can have the kind of spirit that people will say, hey, there's a blessing to be around that person. The staff at the hospital used to go in her room to be encouraged and inspired by her because she didn't feel sorry for herself. And she didn't go through life blaming everybody. See, a lot of people like to try and cheat. I was with a friend of mine and we were, went into a service station to get some gas. They gave me back too much change. I discovered it down the road and I was turning around going back. I said, you're a fool. Hey man, what when they don't give people enough change? You think they flag the people down? I said, I'm not responsible for them. I'm responsible for me. I went back and I told the guy, excuse me, sir, you gave me a $20 bill too much. I gave it to the guy, the guy just took it and walked away, didn't say thank you. The guy in the car laughed, said, I told you, you fool! I said, I'm not responsible for his attitude. I don't care, knowing that he would not say thank you, I would still give it back to him. Because my image of myself says, hey, you don't take something that doesn't belong to you. That's the way my mother raised me. Don't try and cheat, say, well, you know, this little bit won't count. Everything counts. A friend of mine was on welfare after going through a bad experience. Someone, you know, think she and her husband it became ill, they couldn't work for a while, and they went on welfare. After they both became physically well, he said, look here, we don't ever have to go back to work. We're making more money on welfare than we made when we were working with all the Medicaid benefits and, and all of the food stamps and everything. She said, no. She said, we are not going to accept the checks anymore. He said, I'm not going to work. Now you can go to work if you want to. She went down to the welfare department and said, don't send any more checks to my house. Lady said, excuse me? She said, now I've been working here 25 years. No one has ever come in here and said, don't send any more checks in. Are you sure you are right? Yes, I am. And she went home and told her husband, don't look for any more checks because I told him to cut the check off. Now we've got to find something to do. And they started a paper route and got over 1,500 customers and were making money hand over fist in a spirit of dignity and achievement, not ripping anybody off. That was a critical choice. She could have very easily said, well, everybody else is doing it. Why don't I do it? But she decided not to follow the crowd. So let's begin to look at this guy called Joe versus the volcano. And let's see what's in it for us. I took the liberty of changing some things to enable them to be symbolic for us. And Tom Hanks plays his role. And for those of you that have not seen the movie, it's about a guy who was going to work every day. It was very depressing. I mean, when you see it, I mean, the photography is very dingy looking and gray and very dim lighting and, and the people are going in looking drab, doing the same old thing every day in the same old way. Some of you work with people like that. There are faces that you wish you never ever saw. Am I right? I mean, if you never saw them again, it would be too soon. I am I right? I'm going right, all right? So this is what was going on. This guy was going into this job where it was a dead end job. He wasn't happy. He was miserable. And many of us can identify with that. He knew that he was capable of doing more. But he had really given up on himself. He had really sold himself out. Yeah, some of us have done that. He made a trade-off. For whatever reason, he decided to do this. That's why we can identify with him. And the volcano is symbolic of the challenges that we invariably face in life. Of the problems that many of us run away from handling. And he had to handle this. And how did he come in contact with this volcano? Well. What happened was he was going to this doctor constantly, he's a hypochondriac, because he wasn't living his purpose, his dream had not found his life work, he would create illnesses for himself. And so what happened in the process, this doctor decided, he set him up really. See, when you're not living your goal, you go through life living like a victim, people can set you up for anything. They can run any kind of game 
on you and you go for it. I had a saying when I was in radio, stand up for what you believe in because you can fall for anything. Well, Joe didn't believe in very much, including himself and his dreams, see? So he was very vulnerable. And so Joe was set up by this doctor. This doctor told him that he had a rare disease and he had six months to live. This disease was called a brain cloud. He believed it. But you know something? It changed his life. It changed his life. And so he was told, look here, you, you, don't, you don't have long to live anyhow. The guy said, why don't you do this? I'm going to give you all my credit cards and this way you can live like a king. And there's something I want you to do. There was a catch. There's a volcano on an island that's about to erupt. And, and unless somebody jumps in that volcano, sacrifice their life, these people on this island will perish. Well, your life isn't worth much and you don't have that long anyhow. <laughs> so why don't you take my credit cards, all my credit cards, American Express, Master Charge, all, take all of them, go live like a king and die like a man. And Joe said, okay. What did he have to lose? He was going to die anyhow. And his life didn't have any meaning and value to him as it was. So this was no big sacrifice on Joe's behalf. Now that says something about... human beings, that when you have not structured your life so that it can have some meaning and value for you, that you'll be willing to throw your life away into anything. See, the volcano could be alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be a job that does not meet who you are, that you go through life, you're doing it so long, you, you're operating in this and you're acting out that role of mediocrity for so long, you think it's you. It could be a relationship that's no longer giving you what you want and creating dis-ease in your body. It could be any kind of circumstance, like in his work environment, it was toxic, it wasn't good for him. But he didn't have the guts to do anything about it, to act on it. So therefore, it was making him miserable. And as a result, he couldn't see the beauty of life. In fact, in the movie, see, they had in the concrete, there was a, a daisy growing up through the concrete. But people were so caught up in the depression and the gloominess of life, they couldn't even see the daisy when somebody just stepped on it one day. They couldn't see the beauty in life. See, that's what can happen to you in life, that you can get so caught up in the misery of it and the pain and the sickness and the depression and playing a victim and blaming everybody and everything rather than taking responsibility. It will blind you from seeing the stuff out there that's really beautiful. The builder. That was a man who was an efficient builder. He had worked for years in a large company and had reached the age of retirement. His employer asked him to build one more house. It was to be his last commission. The builder took the job, but his heart was not involved. He used inferior materials, timber was poor, and he failed to see the many things that should have been clear to him had he shown even his normal interest in his work. When the house was eventually finished, his employer came to him and said, the house is yours. Here's the key. It's a present from me. The builder immediately regretted that he had not used the best materials and engaged the most capable workers. If only he had known that the house was for him. If he had made a commitment with his life, with his craft, that I'm going to give my best at all times, even if this is my last job, I'm going to give it my best shot because that expresses who I am. He would have been more appreciative of that gift. Would you imagine that? I think that makes a very good point. 
Larry D'Angelo, who I think is going to be one of the greatest motivational speakers around today, told me a story, a true story of a friend of his that every day when he came home from school, when he would get to uh, a certain block in his neighborhood, there was a neighborhood dog that would chase him. And that dog would start after him barking, boy, he would run, just running from that dog every day, every day. Finally, he just got tired of that dog chasing him every day. He said, this dog come around here today, I'm going to take a brick of stuff and bust him in the head. So he was walking home that day, minding his own business. Sure enough, same area, there was that dog there. And the dog started barking, he started running, he saw a brick and he stopped and picked up the brick and turned around. And the dog got close to him, he realized the dog didn't have any teeth. He said, he put the brick down and said, get on out my way. <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, all our lives, many of us go through life running from things that ain't got no teeth to do us any harm. <laughs> Haven't you been afraid to do something and then after you did it, you say, whoa, if I'd known it was this easy, I would have done it before. Haven't you ever had that experience? Raise your hand. Absolutely. So we created this in our minds, false evidence appearing real. We made it real in our minds. That's why Churchill said there's nothing to fear but fear itself. I remember the worst speech I had ever given in my life. I let someone exploit a fear that I had. For years I had a tremendous inferiority complex because I'm not college educated. And this person knew this. And she said, let me write this speech for you. You're going to speak at Ohio State University. Those people are very educated there. And they're going to know when you make grammatical errors. And they're going to know because of the substance of your speech that you are not literate. I, I care about you. I don't want you to embarrass yourself. So this person proceeded to write a speech for me. I had a speech in my mind. But this person was stronger than I was negatively than I was positive about my own thoughts. And I gave my power away. With my permission, I allowed this person to guide me to do something that I really didn't want to do. But I didn't feel enough inner strength and conviction about my skills as a speaker and the message that I had to bring to stick by my guns. And I got up there at the Ohio Union and I read this straight speech and did not move and did not take my eyes off the page because I'm not accustomed to reading. And after I finished, some people gave me a standing ovation because I read it extremely well and I was very tense and I was very nervous. But Boo was with me and we've been together since second grade. And I didn't want to go on the side of the room where he was. I saw the look in his eyes. And another friend of mine by name of Mike Williams and I knew what they were going to say. And they had the look on their face like, what happened to you? <laughs> and so I didn't go over there. I went over here where I could get some compliments. And these people were saying, you were very good. Oh, thank you very much. I wanted to be fortified before I got this whipping. So finally, we were going to the car. and We got in the car. And Boo was trying to be as tactful as he could. And then he just said, that was the worst speech you have ever given. I said, oh, Boo, I know, I know. Why did you read the speech? What happened to your spontaneity? You've always been an extemporaneous speaker. Les, why did you do that? When she told me that they wouldn't accept what I said. Les, let them take you as you are. I gave my power away. Ladies and gentlemen, don't give your power away. You don't need anybody to approve your dream. It was given to you. If they can't see it, it's because it wasn't given to them. 
It was given to you. Hold it, nourish it, cultivate it, work on it. It's yours, it's your baby. Work on it until it comes into fruition. I gave away my power and I said, I'm not going to do that no more. If you've ever given away your power, repeat after me, please. I'm not going to do that no more. <laughs>